Glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, we are continuing our series in John as we have been. We started uh, the Gospel of John back in February. We took a break this summer, and then we began again in John last week. I want to take you. I uh, want, want to invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, open them up to uh, John chapter 6. John uh, chapter 6. Now, if you're borrowing a Bible, there should be a Bible in the seat in front of you. If you don't have a Bible or a device, take that, and that would be on page 838, John chapter 6, as we continue to go through uh, this chapter in John's Gospel. I was thinking this week, as I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about one of the most famous rock songs in the history of music. And uh, it, I'm sure that you have your own guesses, but I think that you would agree with me. I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones is probably one of the greatest rock songs, right? To, to the world would say uh, one of the greatest rock songs in the history of music. That song was written, can you believe this? Like 1965, that song was written. It was like cutting edge at its time, right? It was written in 1965. I was reading about the history of the song. Keith Richards, you know who Keith Richards is? He's the guitarist uh, from Rolling Stone. He actually wrote the riff in his sleep. Now, if you know Keith Richards, you know that that shouldn't surprise you. Um, you know, he's had his issues over the years. He wrote that riff in his sleep. Actually, there was a recorder at the end of his bed, and he didn't know it was on record, and he was just kind of riffing around. He falls asleep. And so when he wakes up, he notices this recorder is on record. He plays it back, and through the 40 minutes of snoring, he, he found this, this riff, and he's like, that's pretty interesting. He took it to Mick Jagger, who was at the same hotel. He was, he was kind of suntanning um, by the pool, and he's like, hey, listen to this. And Mick Jagger wrote the words to I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And I think you all would agree with me is this is, like, I Can't Get No Satisfaction became, at that point in time, the anthem and the attitude of most people, and it still is today. I can't get no satisfaction. Really, and I don't, at the risk of being corny, there is really a void, right? There is really a void in the human heart, and we work very, very, very hard to fill it, do we not? Why is it so hard to accept less? Think about that. Why do we always seem to want more? Maybe it's a, a better job. Maybe it's a, a, a nicer boss. Maybe it's a prettier girlfriend. Maybe it's a newer car. Maybe it's a bigger home. Maybe it's a better vacation. Maybe it's, maybe it's something as insignificant as a better cup of coffee than I had the day before. Right? We're chasing this around, and, and, and the spiritual energies of our lives can be consumed by finding satisfaction in things, are you with me on this? In things that don't satisfy. At the, at the very end of the day, we, we found that out. Those of you who've made a lot of money, who've had everything you've ever wanted, we, we uh, discovered in Ecclesiastes, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, those things don't bring satisfaction. And we are taught here in John chapter 6, well, there are certain parts of this world God created for us to enjoy, no doubt about it. They, they will never be our Savior. They will never be our Savior. Jesus is saying today in John chapter 6, he's saying what he says every, every week in the scriptures, right? Every week in this gospel, he is saying, I am enough I am the soul satisfier. I am the food that your soul needs for satisfaction. That is what he's saying today in John chapter 6. If you're not already there, get there. And I want to just, just spend a, just a few moments at the beginning here. and just Let's just read this together. Verses 22 all the way down. We're going to take a chunk. Verses 22 through 40. And uh, if you do have a Bible, uh, why don't you follow along with me? Here, here, here's what it says. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? In other words, in other words, it's really a how question, right? How did you get here? Like, how did you get here? 
you were on the other side of the sea, like we were doing all this, and then all of a sudden you're over here, like how did you get here? You didn't go on the boat with the disciples, you get it? Okay? Where did you come here? Jesus answered them, verse 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, it's very important right there, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, big idea for today is simply Jesus is God's provision for ultimate satisfaction. Jesus. He is God's provision for ultimate satisfaction. Now, these people, like we just read their story, these people are like us, so often like searching for the wrong things and going to Jesus for the wrong reasons. And it's not even that they got the location wrong, right? It's not even that they got the person wrong necessarily. They're going to the right guy. They're just asking for the wrong things. They're like, what about rules, right? What, what, what about food? Can you show us a sign? And they just keep asking for the wrong things. And Jesus is like, listen, I am, I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one who gives you eternal life if you believe. I'm your true provision. I'm your true satisfaction now and forever if you just put your trust in me. And so the question this morning that we have to answer is that if Jesus is indeed the true bread of heaven, if he is indeed the bread of life, how, how does that make a difference, right? How does that make a difference in my life? How does that change me? Because what, what, what we're seeing in this passage of Scripture right now, as we're studying it, John is trying to let, what he's trying to do is he's trying to reason with us, okay? He's trying to reason with us through this discourse and through the way it's structured to convince us between the reality of Jesus being the bread of life, which as he claims, right, and, and the implications of him being the bread of life in your life, in the responses here that we see from the people. So, and we see the responses, they're just going to be, they're, they're going to continue in John chapter 6. We're going to look at four implications of Jesus being the bread of life, but these implications just sort of keep continuing throughout chapter 6. We're going to look at them next week as well. But Jesus, really, what he's doing today is he's outlining what it really means to believe and that what the relationship must be because of it. And so I want to show you the implication of Jesus indeed, as he claims, being the bread of life. I want to show you four of them in this text today. And we'll just say it like this, if you're taking notes. Since, since he is the bread of life, number one, I need Jesus, not more neat meals. Since he is the bread of life, number one, I need Jesus, not more meals, because what they're doing right now is we'll see it in the text as we unpack it, but they're, they're going for temporary satisfaction, right? 
They're like, man, he he gave us a lot of food the day before. (laughs) Let's get some more food. They're going for the temporary satisfaction. Look at verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea. Now, we remember from last week how the day ended. Jesus fed everybody, and then he told his disciples to what? Get in a boat and go across the lake. And they did. And they got in the boat, but Jesus didn't get in the boat with them. What did Jesus do? He withdrew from the crowds, and he went up to a mountain. And so the crowds know that. The crowds know that, hey, the disciples took off, but Jesus didn't take off with them. Where's Jesus? As good as that meal was, we're going to need breakfast. I mean, that's what we would be thinking, right? I mean, that's what we would be thinking. This is the next day. As good as that meal was yesterday, man, we need some, you know, where's Jesus? We need some breakfast. And uh, that's just how they thought. And, and you got to understand this, okay? Everything was about food back then. Everything. Everything was, a, the, the, the next meal was a daily battle for these people. Like food was a big deal. And we, we just go to the pantry, right? When we get an itch for something salty or sweet, we just go to the, the aisle of the grocery store. It's no big deal. But these people, man, the, these people were eating to live, not living to eat. Life was a battle for bread. So here comes these little boats. Do you see that in verse 22? These little boats, these little boats from Tiberias, which is all the way across the lake, south, west. And they come to this location because word, think about it, word has already gotten around the lake. People are like, Jesus is major miracles over here. We got to go check it out. And when the crowd sees that Jesus wasn't there, uh, they know that they're in the wrong place because they want to be where Jesus is. So they got in the boats, basically water taxied across the lake to Capernaum. And they said to him, when they saw him in Capernaum, look at what they say. They say, Rabbi, when did you come here? How did you get here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Now let's just pause here for a moment. This is what he's talking about right here. And this is why so many of us come to Jesus. And Jesus wants to correct our thinking He wants to heal our hearts in this regard. The the second seeking is causal to their stomach. Do you see that? Like the second, they're seekers of personal fulfillment. They want another meal. They want Jesus. Jesus is an instrument for them to receive some more food. They want temporary satisfaction. I love what John Piper said about this passage. He said they're fixated on the product, not the person. Ooh, think about that in, in terms of your own life. They're, they're fixated on the product, not the person. And Jesus knows this, and he says in verse 27, do not work, do not work for the food that perishes. You know, what is, what is he saying in Matthew chapter 6? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. So gracious right there, right? For on him God the Father has set his seal. Now, this idea of seal most likely goes back to the baptism when the Holy Spirit comes down and inaugurates his ministry. God's placed his seal and approval on him and he's given him the power to do miracles and healings. And Jesus says, listen, you you ignore the signs and what they point to and you come for me for crackers. You're pursuing the wrong thing. It's not not the product, Jesus says. It's not the product. It's the person you should be pursuing. I'm the treasure, not my gifts. That's what he's saying. You don't need more meals. You need more of me. That's what you really need. Now, the implication is if you say, if you say, well, I'm interested in Christianity. I'll give it a try. I'll come and bite on it. If it helps me reach my goals... You're not coming to God, you're coming to God as a cosmic butler, you know? You're, you're coming to God as, you know, so, sort of like you ring your bell and he comes and he delivers, right? You're coming to God as a genie Jesus, you know? And that's why the prosperity gospel, I mean, you think about the prosperity gospel, it's so deadly. It's so deadly because this is what they're preaching. God can give you stuff. You come to God, God will give you a better life. God will give you that BMW you've always wanted, that fat bank account. God will give you that position. God will give you that prominence. 
That's, the, that's a false gospel, but so many are drawn to it. Jesus is, I mean, come on, Jesus is all satisfying because he gives everything to me? Jesus is all satisfying because everything is going great in my life? Really? Jesus is all satisfying because I have the car I've wanted, or I have the house I've always wanted, or I've had the health I've always wanted? What about when things go wrong? When things go wrong, really, really the prover of whether Jesus is your bread or life, when things are go wrong and you get, up and you get upset and say, well, why did I go to church? <laughs> what good is going to church every week? When things go wrong and God doesn't deliver on what you think he should deliver on, what do you, why should I read the Bible? Why should I trust him? He didn't deliver when I needed him to deliver. You know what that shows you came to him on the basis of a product, not on the basis of person. My number one priority, you're saying, is temporary satisfaction, not soul satisfaction. God is a means to you. Is God a means to you? Or is he the end? I do this and this and this, and if I do this and this and this, I ought to get this, this, and this, and if I'm not getting this, this, and this, then I don't really want this. God is useful maybe to you. God is an instrument. God is a means to an end. But listen, what Jesus is saying is when you set your eyes on Christ as the crucified, risen Son, as the true bread of life, and you consume, you eat, meaning you believe, something about everything changes in your life. And the food that perishes, guess what? No, no longer dominates your thinking no longer dominates your mind. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is none that I desire besides you, the psalmist says. Though my flesh and my heart and my circumstance may fail, what does it say? You are my portion. You are my strength forever. Jesus is God's provision for ultimate satisfaction. rather, Not the things that He gives you. Not the gifts but the giver himself. Four necessary implications, number two, since he is the bread of life. I need Jesus. I need Jesus, not more morality. Now these folks, they're used to the rabbi giving them more stuff to do, right? I mean, they, they, they gave him like 630 things to follow, okay? 630 rules. What's a few more rules? These guys are all about like, just give me the checklist, let me do it. Give me the checklist, What's the morality code? I'll follow it, and then we're good, right? This, they're so used to that. They're used to rabbis giving them more stuff to do. Because they say to him, look at verse 28, what must we do? What must we do? That's their first question. What must we do to be doing the works of God? In other words, what are the rules? You know, What are the systems? What are the loops that I have to jump through? That's what they're saying. Jesus said, no, no, listen, this is the work of God. You see that singular not works, but work. This is the work of God. What is it? That you believe in Him. One thing, one thing, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Jesus, in other words, is saying, listen, the answer to all your religious questions and your desire for activity, this is what Jesus is saying, the answer to all your morality, he says, is really found in the faith, in faith in the person of Christ. He is coming, mind you. He is coming to the most impeccably moral people, and he is saying everything that you have done up to this point counts for nothing unless you believe. That's what he's saying. All the rules and all the systems and your whole religious system, listen, it doesn't matter your culture. This is what he's saying to him. It doesn't matter your heritage. It doesn't matter your emotional uh, temperament. It doesn't matter uh, your record. It doesn't matter but that you believe and you'll have life. And if you reject, you'll be condemned. And listen, the declaration that Jesus is making here now about the necessity of believing and the absolute necessity to abandon uh, their religious system, it actually triggers them at this moment. And it, and it leads to more defection. And it leads, you will see it through uh, John chapter 6. 
and all the way through the rest of John. And it leads to more rejection. And it leads to actually a plan to kill Jesus. All that he said right there that day in that synagogue triggered. But that's the very heart of the gospel, isn't it? The gospel says, listen, the gospel says your relationship with God is not based on how good of a performance you've done this week. It's not based upon how good of a performance you did last week or last month or last year, but it's based on Jesus' performance for you. His perfect standard was met, God's perfect standard was met by none other than the bread of life, the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He lived the life we should have lived. We could never live. We could never meet God's standard. He died the death we deserve to die. He took the punishment. I love, I love, I was thinking about this this week. I, one of those, one of the things about preaching the gospel is that you kind of go back into your childhood if you grew up in the church because there's so many like really cool felt board moments on, you know, as you're preaching through the gospel of John. And one of them for me, it's not in the gospel of John, but it made me think of back, back when I was younger. You know the story of Naaman? Those of you who've read the Bible through or maybe grew up in church, the story of Naaman. Naaman was this, this sort of, he was a bigot, by the way. Um, but he was this powerful, rich ruler who God allowed to get leprosy, to prove a point. And Naaman, who was rich and powerful, he gets leprosy. And what does Elisha? Elisha comes up to Naaman and he's like, hey, listen, this is what you need to do. You need to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. Now, first beat, Naaman's a bigot, right? He's like, I got to go where the common people go? Are you serious? I'm rich, I'm powerful. You know who I am? He starts getting angry. Not only that, he's like, you got something harder for me to do? Like anybody, any idiot can wash, right? Like, like anybody can dip in the river. That's like no big thing. What, what do I got to do? Is there some money I got to pay? Is there some hoops I got to jump through? What are the works? What are the works? And he's furious, right? If you, if you read the story, he runs away in rage. And I love the servants in this story. Nobody talks about the servants, but the servants are brilliant. And they take a risk. They take a risk. And they go to Naaman. And they say, hey, listen, if, if, if that prophet, Elisha, had told you to do something great, you wouldn't have even questioned him. How much more then should you do this, what he says right now? And it's like, it's like, wow, they get it, right? They get it. The requirement of the gospel is to see that you cannot fulfill the requirements. That's the beauty of the gospel. The requirement and the beauty of the gospel is to see that you cannot fulfill the requirements. It's a non-requirement requirement. The great thing is to see that you cannot do a great thing. Before God, it doesn't matter your performance, right? It doesn't matter how many good works you do. You know why? Because the thing that really blocks you from the bread of life is, in fact, your performance, is, in fact, your self-righteousness. And that just as easily comes back to us as Christians who, who have surrendered to Christ and found our need for grace. And later and later, if you've noticed this, this is how Satan tempts us, right, as Christians? As you journey through the Christian life and as you come, get older and older in your Christian uh, age, really, you're, you're, there's a t- more of a temptation to rest my identity on my performance. You know, maybe this is you. Oh, when I first became a Christian, I was overwhelmed and I was desperate for my need for grace. But as the years gone by, I somehow find my identity sort of tied up in the things I do for God, my identity tied up in, in my performance. You know what? I'm proud of my theological understanding and knowledge. I have little patience for Christians who are just much too lazy. They're not getting involved in small group. They're not getting involved in, in, in the rhythms of life. And I, I just got little patience for them. I look down on brother and, brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling to faithfully participate. Maybe that's you. I find myself the quick, the quick to judge others and, and, and really quick to celebrate my accomplishments. Maybe that's you. Every Christian activity is an opportunity for me to put just another notch in, in my belt of self-righteousness. I'm active, I'm involved, but there's a little sense of gratitude because, because there's a little sense of need. 
Is there a chance, maybe some of us in here this morning, is there a chance that you have replaced the joy of identity in Christ with the pride of identity in your own morality and righteousness? Are you more critical and judgmental toward the people around you than you are of yourself? A moral person is someone who's always hoping, they're always hoping that they'll be good enough to get through their performance. They're like, their performance, or they think of their performance as flares that go up. It's like God sees it. Oh, I see a flare over here. I'm going to go over there and check that out. Look at that person. Wow, I'm going to go over there and check him out or her out. What does Paul say? Paul says, don't make your boast in your own works. Make your boast in the cross of Christ, not your good works, not your performance, but only in the cross. Why? Because Jesus is God's provision. God's provision for ultimate satisfaction. It's not our ability. It's not our, our righteousness is but filthy rags. It's the righteousness of Christ that can be found only when you submit and come to Him and confess Him as Lord and Savior. Number three, these are critical, these are critical implications. Friends, these are, these are absolutely necessary. If Jesus is indeed the bread of life, I need him, not more miracles. All right? I need Jesus, not more me- meals. I need Jesus, not more morality. And I need Jesus, not more miracles. Now, they're not getting it. They, they just, they're like us, right? They're just slow to understand. It's slow, either little by little, but, but a lot of them aren't getting it. And so what do they go to? They go to meals, and then they go to morality. And now, and now Jesus is following them, by the way. And now they're going to miracles. They're going to signs. They're going to what we would call supernatural interventions. God, do something now, and I'll trust you. Show me that you're actually here, and I'll trust you. We do that all the time. And this is what they do. Look at what they say. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe? Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, it's kind of laughable, isn't it? Did he not just feed like 20,000 people? I mean, it's crazy. And they come across the lake and they're like, listen, what sign do you do that we may see and believe? Now again, we must remember just the day before, the first following, them running to the other side of the lake, that was, they were curious it, but it was caused by other miracles Jesus had done. They saw healings. They saw demons cast out. They saw these incredible miracles and signs. And so they ran across the lake to Jesus. But this second seeking, them coming back across to find Jesus, is causal to their stomach, not their observation of the miracle, which plays into them actually saying right here, what sign do you have for us? What work do you perform? Look at verse 31. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Now they're, now they're taking Jesus on a history like tour, right? They're giving him a history lesson. They're taking him all the way back to Exodus. And they're like, listen, our fathers, in other words, Moses, right, ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And uh, in other words, like Moses, Jesus, listen, your miracle is great. It was great. It was great. Thank you. But Moses, man, pulled this thing off for 40 years. He pulled the food thing off for 40 years. We love the whole fishes and loaves thing. But Moses fed millions of people for years in the wilderness. Can you top that? So I don't have to keep going fishing? Could you top that, please? This is what they want. All they want is physical satisfaction. All they want is self-satisfaction because Jesus says to them, He says, truly, truly. And again, when we say truly, truly, what does it mean? Like lean in, listen up. You don't want to, you want to remember this. This is it. Lean in. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. So there's a couple things going on. Number one, first, Jesus is saying, way too much Moses, not enough father. Way too much Moses. And and he basically is what he's saying to them. He's saying, if you're quoting the Bible, quote it correctly. That's what he's saying. He's saying, like Exodus 16 says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Jesus is saying, Moses didn't bring the bread. The Father brought the bread. He says, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, which really what what that does is really extenuates who who he is and why 
it wasn't Moses who really actually gave the bread to them. First, too much Moses, not enough Father. That's a problem. But secondly, Jesus is saying, you, you got, you're, you're way too focused on the shadow that you don't see the substance. You, you're, too much shadow, not enough substance. Look, look at what he says. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. In other words, don't get hung up on the manna. You're getting hung up on a miracle. You're getting hung up on the manna. The manna is merely a foreshadow of the true bread of heaven. The manna is merely a shadow of the substance. You think you have a greater sign in your history because your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, Jesus is saying. But I'm right here before you as the very bread of heaven that was foreshadowed actually in the provision of the manna. I'm right here. I'm the whole point of the manna. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the substance. I'm the shadow that you're talking about. You had to eat every day and it only lasted for a day and then you had to go back out and collect it for the next day. By, you know, just so on and so on and so on. Jesus later says in John chapter 6, you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will be forever satisfied. I don't know, maybe all our problems come. Maybe, maybe your problem comes from you're just so busy looking for a sign that you don't see the sign, right? You're so busy looking for a sign that you don't see the Savior. I mean, Jesus is doing a lot of miracles in his Galilean tour. This is what he's doing. He's doing a lot of miracles. And, and if you notice, if you trace them back through the Gospels, they're redemptive miracles. Healing people, casting out demons, calming the sea, feeding people. Notice he wasn't casting out the Romans, right? He wasn't taking political and military power and rewarding good people and punishing bad people. He wasn't doing any of that. He was doing grace miracles. He was doing his miracles foreshadowed the greatest miracle of all time, which is the cross of Jesus Christ and the subsequent resurrection. Jesus is like, what you really need, what you really need is not another miracle. You need forgiveness. You need to be redeemed. You need grace. You will never be satisfied. You'll just go to one sign, to the next sign, to the next sign, to the next sign. You'll never be satisfied if you deny the thing you really need. And what's so sad, I mean, I, I remember as a boy, I used to watch those TV preachers, those peddlers of the gospel, uh, twist and pervert the gospel to get money out of the pockets of people, right? And these people were like hook, line, and sinker. These people were all about the sign, man. It's just like, give me a sign. They, 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 they worship the sign. Old people, dying people, people looking for a miracle, like a lottery ticket to win. And sadly, those people don't understand the glorious gospel. They're all hopped up on miracles. They're all addicted to miracles, but they're not addicted to the maker of the miracle. Tune in every week without fail, ready to mail their paycheck in for a miracle. I just need another miracle. And we're, we're, it's not, we're, we, we don't want to blame them, right? We, look at us. We're sign seekers. God, I just need proof right now. I just, if, if you just show yourself right now, Never mind that you gave me your word. <laughs> Never mind that you, you gave me your son and the Holy Spirit who indwells in me. I just need, I just need some proof. Tr show me and I'll trust. Give me some sort of sign. And that's how sin works, right? That's how sin works. Some of you are just constantly saying, for example, something bad is happening in my life. Bad things have happened in my life. Something bad is going to happen in my life. And if God doesn't come through, God needs to give me a sign. He needs to answer my prayer. If he doesn't, I don't know if I could trust him. Unbelief rejects signs. The crucifixion proves that, right? You go back to the story of John after Jesus had done all these miracles for three years, they still put him on a cross and rejected him. They, they, they held out their trump card. Well, you know, he didn't do anything heavenly. That's what they said. It's all sort of earthly. And what Jesus is saying is you're looking for a sign, but what you fail to see is the sign in front of your face, the living God incarnate, 
the Messiah, the Son of God, the promised Savior, the promised King, the anointed one who has come to offer you himself as the bread of life. That's the one sign you need. And it's sin that just makes us want something more than that. It's pride that makes me feel either too good or too bad. I need something besides this. I need a date. I need a boyfriend. God, send me a man. That's a sign, you know? I need a woman. I need success. I need this or I need that. What more can he give you than his own son? Jesus is God's promise for ultimate satisfaction. One final, we're running out of time, one final implication that you need to hear and understand and embrace. I need Jesus, not more me. When it comes down to it, I need Jesus, not more me. More of him, less of me. Jesus said to them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Now, now, there's something going on here. We see, John loves it. John is, if you read the Gospel of John, he is into the sovereignty of God. And all over the Gospel of John, it's like it's all of God in salvation. Right? But here in this verse, you sort of see the saving purpose of God. Um, you see what it looks like from the side of man's responsibility, right? If you believe in me, but you don't believe in me, you've rejected me. God offers his son, man is responsible to see and believe, but what's happening in the text, they're not seeing, they're not believing, they're rejecting. Jesus is like, if you would just trust me, trust me for my satisfaction. But notice, then he turns and he he focuses really the saving purpose of God from, from the viewpoint of God's sovereignty. Jesus, and Jesus leans into it really hard. He says in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoa. He just said to people, you don't believe in me. You're rejecting me. And then he says in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Now, number one, I I can't spend a lot of time on this. I'm already already past my time as it is. But listen, man's responsibility and God's sovereignty are not enemies. They're not at odds with each other. Uh, Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it a great way. He said, for, for a lot of us, we think of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility as two parallel, parallel lines that never meet. They, they just never meet, but they do meet. And we have to understand that they're not at odds with each other. There is this sense of man's responsibility in the ocean of God's sovereignty. Revelation 22, whosoever will may come. John 1.12, as many as received him. I mean, there's just no question about an invitation here. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who are weary. Come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But here's what I find, and maybe this is you. When I first came to Christ, it just felt like I was choosing, you know? When I first came to Christ, it felt like I was seeking Jesus and I was, I was choosing him. And I remember that day in Nevada, and I was on my face before the Lord, and I was crying out to him to save me and forgive me. But as I've matured in my faith, and I've walked years and years and years in this thing called Christianity, the more I see that he chose me. The more I look back and I see what was orchestrated, that I wasn't seeking God for anything. He sought me. He sought me out. He gave me the faith to turn to him and believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Isn't that great news? If you believe in him, if you've trusted in him as your all-satisfying Savior, as your bread of life, he will never cast you out. But I want to I share one more thing real quick. In this whole idea of sovereignty, and Jesus is really bringing up the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of the Father, you really see the humanness of Jesus. Now, I was reading John MacArthur's commentary this week, and he brought out an insight that I didn't see. I want to share with you. I mean, Jesus has just got to look out right now, right? He's healed so many people. He's proclaimed the gospel to so many people, yet most of them have rejected him. 
And he's just got to look out and be profoundly sad. You know what it's like to be rejected? You know what it's like? Portrayal is like one of the worst things there is. And he's got to look out like he did over Jerusalem, right? In John chapter 11, we'll see him over Jerusalem weeping over Jerusalem. It's got to be heartbreaking for Jesus right now. So much rejection. Yet in the midst of rejection, what does he do? He shows us what to do. He trusts in the sovereignty of the Father. That's what he does. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will, look at it, verse 38, the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Why does divine sovereignty pop up in this chapter? Because Jesus, like us, in the midst of profound disappointment, leans hard on the sovereignty of the Father. Leans in on divine sovereignty to catch his balance and to hold him up. And it's the same place we go when our child goes wayward. It's the same place we go when we get that call from the doctor and he says, you only have a few months to live. It's the same place we go when, when that spouse abandons us or, or, or you get laid off from that job you don't necessarily love, but you desperately need it. The only way we have to go at times is to lean on the sovereignty of God. You can do what only you can do. And this is what Jesus does here. He turns in his disappointment and he entrusts himself to the Father who would do all he promised to do. Verse 40, this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will, he says it again, I will raise him up on the last day. I believe in Jesus as the one who truly satisfies. He's my bread of life. I believe in Jesus as the one who will save. Whosoever will may come. And whoever comes, I will never cast out. I believe in Jesus as the one who truly secures me. I will raise him up on the last day. I will not lose one of them. I'm not going to trust in my own self-effort. I'm not going to trust in my own agenda or my own abilities or my own strength or my own whatever. Self-focus is the reason we worry. Self-focus, friends, is the reason we, we have anxiety. And we're weighed down with how we look and we fret over our resumes and how much money we're making and these things become our garments. These things become our gold. Jesus says, look away from those things. I'm the satisfaction. I'm the security. I'm the saving one. These other things are destroying you. They're keeping you from experiencing all that I am and all that I can be in your life. Now, as we draw down to the close, the crowds, they see them. They see them. They're at the right location. They're looking at the right person, but they're seeing him with eyes of their own flesh. They're hearing him as a challenge to their own heritage. They're trusting him as if what they're going to say in verse 42, we know who you are. You're from Nazareth. Your father's Joseph. We know know your parents. Who who do you think you are? Who does this guy think he is? He's going to satisfy us? He's going to take away our hunger and our thirst? But listen, what this passage is saying, if, if you believe, if you would trust him as the one who truly satisfies, if you would trust him as the one who truly saves, who truly secures, if you would hear him with your ears, he's a better manna, he's a better bread that gives life to the world. If you would see him with different eyes, pursue him, not not for the sake of more meals, but seeing him as a sign of the Messiah which changes everything about your life and experiencing that ultimate provision that is found only in the one who satisfies, the true bread of life, the ultimate satisfaction, Jesus Christ.